Welcome to this World Sat Sangha on the 28th of December 2019 in conjunction with Kevin Moore and The Moore Show. And I wish Kevin a Happy New Year and I'm sure he wishes all of you a Happy New Year as well. And we thank him very much for the work he's doing in broadcasting these presentations and the work he's doing with his own work in terms of exposing the greater reality and presenting it to people in a way that they can understand and the way that he, his, his own particular personality and style demands. Okay, thank you. So let's have a look at the. Uh, oh, and uh, happy Christmas to you all, and of course, looking forward to a happy new year as well. And it's quite good this is because the end of me meditation is to is to help you start the new year in a fresh way, um, without any preconceptions or or issues that have been brought forwards from the rest of the year or previous years as well. Okay, let's have a look at the agenda then. Um, First one is a talk uh, about how to have an efficient incarnation. And it's based upon a question that was asked to me from one of my clients uh, in November. And um, with a bit of luck, we'll be able to go through that and, and take on board some of the information that was given to that particular client, but also augment it in, in a general way. And whilst also diving into some certain aspects of how this could work for us all. Uh, then we go into the, the questions, and I've got a lot of questions uh, already. We've got enough questions for this month as well, as we had we had enough questions from, from November, and that spilled over into December, with also having uh, enough questions for a lot of January as well. So um, thank you very much for those people who send those questions in. Yeah, they're always very, very useful, and uh, very searching as well, and they're, they're excellent, because they not, they not only um, challenge the understanding of what the of what the, the reality is around us in terms of the three frequential reality but also the greater reality and it's good for me because i have to do some channeling to understand the the, the answers to the questions as well so i'm uh, i'm very pleased with that so let's have a look at uh, this lecture on how to have a an efficient incarnation so in in real terms <clears throat> what do you mean by an efficient incarnation? So we'll, get, we'll have a defi definition bit first before we start to see how we can do it. Now, <clears throat> an efficient incarnation is basically dealing with the items that we have on our life plan, those goals that we want to achieve during a particular incarnation, um, and achieving them and <laughs> getting out of the incarnation, or doing them as fast as possible and as, uh, as correct as possible, with as much evil, uh, ev uh, experiential and evolutionary opportunity taken as, uh, as possible to maximise the reason for being here. And that means that we basically we could, we could achieve these things uh, quite quickly in our incarnations and then move out of our incarnation back into the energetic. Now, from the perspective of the human being, this might think, well, hang about, am I reducing my lifetime by doing this? And the answer is quite possibly, but also, moreover, you might be increasing the depth of which you can experience these things, um, and also you might be experiencing the opportunity to expand the, the, uh, the ability to experience, learn and evolve in this particular lifetime in a way that you wouldn't have been able to in a previous lifetime. So, that means really that the efficiency of the incarnation is to do with how well we get to our goals, those items and the life plan that we've uh, chosen to have in this particular incarnation. And we've chosen it with, with, in keeping with our true energetic self requirements. It may even have given us those particular things we need to, exp need to experience, learn and evolve with. But in general, they will have also been um, agreed with our guide and helpers as well. So the efficiency side of things is to just deal with it. Now, that means that if we're walking down a road or a street um, in a shopping center, for example, <coughs> and we're surrounded by shops, all of, these all of these different shops offer different things to buy. Some of them actually are actually sort of um, offer offering the opportunity for you to, to sell your product to them, for instance, if, you're, if it's a pawn shop. 
or there's other areas where you can buy things like food, uh, as a delicatessen for things for pastries or chocolatiers for chocolates, coffee, clothes, uh, hardware, um, cars, motorbikes, push bikes, you know, boats, all of these different things that are on these the, these um, these shops on this road. But if the if the objective is to get to the end of the road, because the the experience is at the end of the road, then all of these different things in these different shops are by and large distractions. They're things that attract us and we go into the shop and have a look. We call this window shopping, don't we? We don't actually go into the shop and buy anything, much to the annoyance of the shopkeeper most of the time, but the actual fact we go in there and have a look. And we might buy something off, you know, off, on the spur of the moment or off, or, or off the cuff, or we might just get some ideas for something um, that we want to do in the future. But the essence is that if we wanted to get to the end of the road and achieve what we wanted to achieve, we wouldn't be bothered about these shops and go into these shops. And so what we see here is the efficiency is based upon the time it takes us to get from the conceptual uh, intuition, intuitive based idea or desire, which is sometimes we, we, we gain ourselves or we actually have it imprinted upon our, our psyche um, by our guide and helpers to get to, to the, the experience, which is at the end of the road. But if we don't do that, if we get distracted, then the time it takes us to go from the end of the, the star point to the end of the road can go from being, you know, <laughs> seven minutes, for instance, to seven hours or even seven weeks or seven years, depending upon how we want to experience the journey from getting where we were to getting to the end of the road. Now, let's say that the whole point of getting to the end of the road is to meet an individual that we will share an experience with and that, it, that the sharing of that experience is, it enables us to grow in, in a certain way and allows us to be able to function in a certain way where other experiences are going to be easier. If we miss the meeting of this individual because we get distracted, that individual won't be there when we, when we actually get towards the end of the road. So what we have is this, we've made the journey, we've got to the experience, but the depth, but the depth of the experience isn't exactly um, available for us because we've missed that particular that particular um, juncture, so to speak, when the individual where, where an individual we're supposed to be experiencing the experience with is no longer there because we've been too slow. If, on the other hand, we'd run from one end of the road to the end of the road and we completely bypassed these these shops totally, we can get to the end of the road and be there before the individual we're supposed to meet. And so we can get bored if we're not careful, we lose patience and we, and we move away. We move away before the person who we're supposed to, to, to experience, learn and evolve a certain experience with, sort of arrives there and we've gone. So we've missed them. So we, we can either miss them by getting distracted by um, going into these shops, being distracted, having other things we should be doing or shouldn't be doing, or we can move too quickly and get to the experience before we're supposed to. And so what we get here is the the possibility of having an inefficient incarnation through being distracted or an inefficient incarnation through being too eager. So we have to follow what the Buddhists call the middle road. And that means we have to understand that if we feel we have to experience something, then we have to experience it in a timely way. Now I'm using time a lot in this particular dis um, lecture because it's the only way to describe it really. But that, and that's, that is in terms of the passage of us going from one point to another point. Clearly we go through event spaces, but I'm going to kind of continue to use the word time because it makes sense in terms of how we describe things in this particular way. So the efficiency of the incarnation is to do with getting to the points we're supposed to get to, experiencing what we're supposed to experience at the right point in our incarnation, the right time in our incarnation, because we have to experience what's there at that point, and, we have to, and maybe we have to experience what's there with another individual at that point as well. And so what we experience is the right experience with the right individuals at the right time. And the, all of this is being <coughs> handled in the background by our guide and helpers, because they will be also working with the guide and helpers of the individual or individuals that we were supposed to meet with and experience that experience with 
And if we're not there, that, then then what they're supposed to be doing is is is, is affected as well. So we're not only affecting our own efficiency by getting to the the meeting point so to speak or the juncture too quickly or, or not quick enough but we're also affecting the the efficiency of the individual or individuals we're supposed to be liaising with to experience that experience so our inefficiency creates an inefficiency in the ability to for others who we are supposed to be working with to also experience learn and evolve at the same time and don't forget that they will be having a similar problem as well. So, so this, so if we're all being distracted or all super eager, we start to miss our junctures where we're supposed to experience something with certain individuals by being there too early or too late, or they're too early or too late, or we meet somebody else instead, and that can, that, that throws a complete curveball into it. So, the efficiency is doing what we're supposed to do and and being being focused on it. Not getting there too quickly, not getting there too slowly, not being distracted, not being too eager to get there. Yeah? I can remember a long time ago when I um, was starting work, I wanted to get to a certain level really, really quickly. And, and that was, a, that, that's, that's, a, you know, that, that's called ambition. But at the end of the day, you can have ambition, but if you don't have the uh, the experience to uphold that ambition you don't go anywhere all you get is frustration and frustration is a resistance factor and the resistance factor is uh, a way of stopping our efficiency in a particular incarnation so in so in essence it's 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 all about let's say getting from point a to point b and experiencing things in a timely way at the right time in the right place with the right individuals and that everybody else is doing the same thing so if we're all doing it properly if we're having an efficient incarnation where we're not experiencing the same thing over and over again, because if we're not getting it right, <laughs> we get something called cyclic karma, where our guide and helpers keep putting the same thing in front of us time and time again for us to experience because we haven't experienced it properly or we've, or we've ignored the experience or renounced the experience, for instance. And so what we have here is the again the capability of of not experiencing what we're supposed to experience because we've, we, we're choosing not to. And again, that causes a problem as well. So it's all to do with, you know, being efficient, doing what we're supposed to be doing, going to the shop. If, if you need to go to the shop, go to the shop and go and, go, and, go, and go, in, go into that shop and buy exactly what you need and don't browse. If you think about when some of us have partners who come shopping with us, some partners are you know, let's go to the shop and we've got a list of stuff and we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do the other. We're going to get lettuce, tomatoes, we're going to get the milk, we get some cheese. Um, if you're a meat eater, you'll get meat, you might get some confectionery, you might get some toiletries. You know, you get all these things and then you leave the shop. Whereas some individuals, they go into a shop and the list of things that has to be bought in the shop is almost secondary or even third or even tertiary. So, so in that perspective you can spend a lot of time in the shop which is what big department stores like because they like you to browse and some shops are designed to trap you into the browsing around and buying more than you want to routine um, rather than you know going in there and, and, and achieve what you need to achieve which is just buy what you need to buy so this is the way we, we create the the um, the efficiency the car the cyclic karmic karmic thing with the guide and helpers is, is quite interesting because the, the more we ignore a particular experience the harder it gets to do it so if, we, if, we don't, if we're not responding properly the next time it'll be harder to do the, the experience will be harder it'll be harder to get out of it and again that's another function of creating an, an efficient incarnation as well look at what we're doing don't rush into the response to, to a particular demand from us Look at how it can be best actioned and then action it. So sometimes that means just if somebody asks you a question, you don't just give them an answer straight off. You have to say, hang on, I need to think about this a moment. I'll come back to you in a moment. Give yourself 10 seconds or more to be able to respond to somebody, specifically if, there's a, if it's somebody who's stressed out and wants an instantaneous answer. You need to make sure that you give them a proper answer that's got depth and detail to it in a way that they'll understand, rather than just giving them a fast answer, which maybe 
correct, but I've not have the depth and detail, which means they'll come back and ask for the depth and detail later. So it's being efficient in how you deal with things on an every way level. You know, if you're going to get fuel for the car, go and get fuel for the car. You don't go to a shop <laughs> to go and get something else instead. You know, if you're going to go to the bathroom, you go to the bathroom. You don't spend 20 minutes reading a book, for instance. I know people do. <laughs> we, we all go through that routine at some point. But it's, also, it's all about what we need to do, we go and do, and we deal with it, and then we come back to what we're supposed to be doing in, 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 a, in, a, in a bigger sense. So the efficiency lies in doing what you need to do and no more. Go down the road to the end of the road to meet the individual you're supposed to meet and not get distracted by the shops. Deal with what you deal, need to deal with in the correct way, with the correct level of depth and the correct level of detail, and don't need to do it again. Or do it again because it's harder. Look at everything as, not specifically a challenge, but as an opportunity to do it right, so that you can achieve your evolutionary progression in a faster way. Incarnation is, a, is quite a, a privilege, certainly incarnation on Earth, because we've got individualised free will. And our evolutionary progression is augmented as a result of it. So why not deal with our incarnation in an efficient way so that we finish all of our goals and then have the opportunity to extend our experiences here in a particular incarnation. So we can do two incarnations or even three incarnations or the content associated with two or three, two or three incarnations in a single incarnation. So rather than doing 3,000 incarnations, you'd end up with 1,000 incarnations if you do it that way. Or well, you might even reduce it even further. So that's how to have an efficient incarnation. Deal with everything that you do with in, in, a, in an efficient and logical well, or intuitive way. Okay, And deal with it once rather than deal with it three, four, five, six, or seven, eight, or nine, ten, nine times or even ten times. And don't get, don't get distracted by the shops when walking down the road. Okay. <laughs> I've had some fun doing that actually because I was seeing lots and lots and lots of different um, uh, visualizations of, of, of different things that I've done in the past where I've been distracted as well. So it's quite a, it's quite illuminating for me, not only for for telling you um, wonderful individuals who are listening to this this uh, this lecture, but it's also uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to see how it's, how it's affected me as well and how I've sometimes not been, had a particularly efficient incarnation, even though I thought I think I have sometimes. Okay, let's go to the questions then. We've got quite a few questions here. I'm just having a look how many questions we've got. Okay, we've got quite a few. We've got some from uh, US. We've got some from EM and JM, which we've taken from the rest of the list that was in November. Okay, so the first question is from US, and this is question three from US from November, and there's also a question four from US in November as well. So... In question three, you told us that backfield people make 12 to 15% of the population now. Some of them have managed to put themselves in positions of power, such as the current US president, your uh, English prime minister, and their buddies and similar characters around the world. Yep, fine. Is this the first multiversal cycle that backfield people are allowed to incarnate into human form? Were they used in previous cycles? And if so, did they accelerate uh, fully sentient human evolution? That's a very good question. Um, let me just ask the question. I'm being told this is the first time, and the reason this is the first time is because, for those of you who've been listening to the, the sat sounds before, this is the third evolutionary cycle. And so, as a result of that, we are um, moving faster than the second evolutionary cycles. So the first two evolutionary cycles, although they, have, they are a progression in speed of experience uh, from one to the other, so the second is faster than the first and the third is faster than the second, there's a certain level of, shall we say, um, logarithmic progression associated with this as well. And what I'm finding out is that in the, the first two evolutionary cycles, there wasn't a need for the use of a backfill individual to um, fill the gaps in because people were sending the frequencies fast. Whereas the way, the way it's happening now, even though we're experiencing low a low frequency condition and a consistent low frequency drop, so to speak, 
overall, there's more people uh, ascended to the, to the next level faster than, than any other period in this particular um, evolutionary cycle. So this is the first time that um, the next gen, the next uh, genre of sentience down from where we are has been included in the opportunity of having individualized free will uh, in a particular location. So this is the first time. So the second part of this is it's hard to see how they could do that since they, they tend to make very impulsive decisions that often ring as close to ex existential crisis, i.e. nuclear weapons held hostage in the hands of other unstable leaders or pro probably nuclear exchange worse, worse than World War II. So, yeah, so, it's, so it is, I mean, I think the, the, this, this, the, I'll, I'll read the second part and probably even the third part of this. Uh, there's about seven parts actually. Their authoritarian style po politics tends to attract a cult of other backfield people who would prefer to see everything crash and burn, e.g. financial crisis, religious rapture or end of time scenarios, politically and or race, racially motivating killings, ethnic cleansing or genocide. How does this serve the rest of humanity? It, it, it doesn't, doesn't. Um, so getting back to this, this is the first time backfield people have been allowed to incarnate here. It's simply a case of, in, in, <coughs> as with other world leaders who've been classified as antichrists, the opportunity for us to see things going wrong and correct it um, is quite an evolutionary opportunity for us. So to, to to, to be the comeback kids, so to speak, gives us more evolutionary understanding about what we should be doing in the future, another event space, uh, than it does by just not experiencing it. So actually, this is a this is a if you like this is a a way in which we let go of the reins, let the horses run off at their own speed, but then realise they haven't got any direction, and then we have to take control of the reins again. And so, in doing so, we learn something. We learn that we can't let go of the reins. And we learn what happens when we let go of the reins. And that's important to understand because we need to be able to, be able to progress. We need to be in control of each other and ourselves. For, well, ourselves first and then each other. And in that way, we can progress at a much uh, accelerated rate. Whereas if we don't do that, we, we end up being quite random. And um, although random is also... a, a one particular route that we can go down we don't really get the opportunity to be efficient in our incarnations so <laughs> just thought i'd slip that one in there thank you uh, next part of it is what happens to our gross physical earth in the hands of these backfield people who don't care if the amazon rainforest is burning or if you pollute our air water and soil through fracking for instance uh, dirty coal and fossil fuels uh, we will eventually have to rebuild and repair the earth um, and what we'll see is when we've, you know, it's, it's, it's an old saying: you don't know what you've got, what you've, what you've got until it's lost or it's gone. And that's it's very relevant to to people if they lose their partners, but it's also relevant to people who lose uh, their belongings, for instance, or their or their homeland, for instance, um, or things like trees around them. So we've, we've we've got examples around the world of what happens if we don't behave ourselves, and the deserts are a good example of how we've potentially deforested certain parts of the world in previous eras, so to speak. But unless we experience it ourselves, there are times where we don't really understand what we're doing and how it, how it affects. So having to, so experiencing it and then realising what's gone wrong, and then having to, and then having to you know, rapidly um, repair what we're doing wrong, so that we don't crash and burn properly, is, is part of our evolution progression. And we're we sort of starting to do that now. But, uh, but, it's, but it, 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 you know, in, <coughs> if you look at the number of individuals who understand that we've got, we've got to look after the earth versus those who don't care, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a horrible percentage difference. Um, but at the end of the day, <coughs> because these people who don't care just think, well, oh, I'll be around to experience this nonsense, so it doesn't matter, which is completely wrong because they're not protecting the, the environment for other, people, other you know, aspects who want to incarnate and have a good environment to work with. So... In, in essence, what we what we need to do is to take hold of the possibility of the change, not politicise it, and just be, think, behave, and act in a way which is going to uh, allow us to maintain our environment so that other incarnates can come and experience it better uh, in, in, the, in, in another event space and another future. Okay, so we need to act yesterday rather than tomorrow. Next question, are they only going to reincarnate once or will some of them reincarnate on this physical version of the Earth, frequency bands 1 to 3? If it's going to take longer than expected for us to send out of here. Um, well, 
what I'm picking up is that um, <coughs> there's going to be a, a capped limit on the number of in, uh, backfill people or backfill souls that are allowed to incarnate because if you have a continuous um, throughput of new souls who haven't experienced uh, individualized free will they're all making the same pro the, the same mistake over and over again whereas at least if you've got a certain number that have been allowed to come in and they're and they are then allowed to incarnate so to speak um, again and again they start to learn and they evolve so that so that there's, there's this self-correction uh, condition coming into as well so so based upon based upon that what I'm being told here is that it's not going to be a case of um, There'll be new, completely new backfill souls allowed to, to allowed to incarnate. It'll be the same souls, a capped limit of souls that are uh, that are a critical mass, so to speak, that are allowed to reincarnate uh, a, a multiple number of times, so that they can also experience learn and evolve properly. And the the um, the effects of their, shall we say, in poor decision processes will be corrected by others and and by them and by them as well. The next question is that uh, you told us that they don't accrue karma because they're not going to be around for that long but 100 to 200 plus years seems like an awfully long time to put humanity and the earth in the hands of these uh, service to self materialistic characteristic characters who seek power money and sex for themselves um, 100 to 200 years is nothing <laughs> in fact don't, we can't think in terms of years we have to think in terms of how the, yeah, the, the period it takes to get everybody of this particular genre of soul up to the next up to the next frequency so it's it's a little bit like sometimes if you want to get from what point a to point b in a car and that point b is, is to meet a train and if you don't put your foot down the accelerator and and and, and speed for instance break the law and speed you, you'll miss your train then sometimes you have to you know you have to speed run the possibility of uh, of attracting the, the 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 law and also um, expend more more fuel. <laughs> so sometimes we have to do that to be able to meet to do what we what we're supposed to be doing. So although it's it doesn't seem to be quite right and it seems to be quite a negative um, way forwards. In in essence, it's, <clears throat> it's going to give us a a, a possible um, acceleration of the ability of individuals who are capable of going to the next level to go up there faster okay so there's although it looks to be quite negative there's actually a positive that comes out of it as well so the next question sort of sort of tidies this up is that fair to the rest of humanity who is trying to ascend out of here or the earth itself or the entities who chose to come here to assist human humans in their progression do those assistants actually incarnate on frequency band four and drop in and out of frequency band one to three with the help of the laggard souls that are still working in this rapidly deteriorating version of the physical earth with climate change pollution and over pollution it's um with, without the theory of the critical mass and everybody passing over to the, the, the next frequency in one go uh, being available to us because we're all doing it individually slowly then this is the only way forwards really there has to be um, a a critical mass of individuals on the planet that make the planet work in terms of the infrastructure that's been set up the you know the <laughs> the whole things from cities to countries to um, technologies to companies to to educational institutions the whole thing needs to work and continue to work even when the last um, soul on this planet that hasn't moved on to the first the fourth frequency uh, is still here so in essence the, 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 this is it is fair in the rest of humanity but unfortunately it, it's a difficult thing we have to go through when we start to see the error the errors of letting our hands off the reins and we start to start to you know get the Get the reins back and start to control what we're doing then we'll start to move up quickly and so this period of, of the use of backfield people will get shorter because the number of individuals who are sent to the fourth frequency will, in, will will increase rapidly so we won't still we still won't get this um 
this sudden knife edge change or cliff edge change where we all go to the next frequency this with this critical mass where we all go in one go but we will have an accelerated progression upwards of every individual and that and, and that can only be achieved through the backfield people unfortunately once we've understood once we, but once we understand how to how to negate and counteract some of the some of the immature thinking processes that processes that they have and they start and as a result of that they start to progress themselves then it's going to get faster and faster and we'll move up the frequencies faster and faster so it's um, a good question thank you and question four which would have been in in november um and there's three parts to this in the curators you said that event space only provides the space but other entities actually create what is in that space i used to think that event space uh, created or duplicated what was in that space but not us but in October, you gave us a, an event space meditation to change our parallel cells path by backtracking some of the branches or joining other branches to get back to our main line, uh, main line life plan. Mm, yeah, OK, good. Are the event space changes created by us, i.e. one parallel self from, a, from our soul aspect with a desire, intention and thought and action? Or are the changes actually made by the curators, maintenance entities that are in charge of that level of event space function? and optimization well who is the true creator our source us creators or event space what i'm being shown here is that um, <clears throat> if you think about the, 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 the what, what what's been said in the curators have been event space only cre creates the space but other entities actually create what's in that space you have to think of it in a different way you can reproduce a number of, you, let's, let's say you can build a building and copy one building. In this building, there's lots of people working, living, enjoying themselves, etc., etc. But you create another building, which is a complete duplicate of that building. It's still the building, but the people aren't in there. So what event space does is it creates the, the environment that needs to be created as a function of our decision processes. Okay, that also creates different realities, of course. But the, when we get a collective event space being created, that's, that's big enough to create a completely new, new environment, what we have is the, environmental, the environment that, that he's copied over. So it copies everything. Individuals as well. That's the space. Then everything starts, everything functions without knowledge of the fact that it's been, it's been duplicated. We have another part of us which has been created that is, um, you know, another one of us, but which, which is working with a, with a collective event space that is a function of our choices or, or, the, or the other choice we could have had or other choices we could have had that link in with those choices that others could have had, so to speak. And so then we start to create what that's in, in, the, in, the, in that event space. So the event space, when it creates, it, it creates the space with, ever, with, with, with that with that. As, as it is, it's a complete copy. Think of it as a carbon copy. But then what's in that space is, is, is modified with those or by those aspects that are duplicated or copied into that space, so to speak. So, so in essence, everything is the creator. Origins creator, sources creator, we're creators. Curators are creators. Sometimes we create event spaces that aren't necessary. Sometimes we create event spaces that are, <laughs> for want of a better word, in the wrong place. <clears throat> so that's when the curators come in. Sometimes they need to create an event space to, to join up event spaces with, with, if they've come out of what, what would have been a natural alignment of event space. And so it's, it's very complicated to understand, but everything has an, has an effect on event space. Anything that is involved in a decision process or a choice process has the possibility of creating a new event space, either a very localized one, individualized one, or, or a huge one, which, is, which can be multiversally sized for, for, for that perspective. But getting back to the question, you, you, this was I, in the book, The Curator, said that event space only provides the space, but other entities actually create what's in that space. The creation of what's in that space is and starts from the point of which that event space is created so everything is duplicated and then it moves forwards and that's the and that's the creation of what that which is in the event space 
The event space creates everything in one go, but it is devoid of creativity. It's devoid of expression. It's devoid of uh, evolutionary progression. A second later, it starts to experience that because the copied individuals, copied aspects, move into it and start to work with it and start to experience it and change it and change it again. So I hope that's a, a, um, answers that particular question. It's a difficult one for people to understand, but people will think that, oh, we create an event space, there's nothing in it. But no, of course there's, of course there's, there's whole galaxies in there, there's, there's planets in there, there's, or if it's a universally sized event space, but if it's a planetary sized event space, then there's a planet in there, and all the, all, everything that's in there. It's not a raw space, it's, it's, it, it is a carbon copy of what was there, which has achieved nothing and experienced nothing and then a second later it starts to do that because the other individuals who are part of the decision process start to interact with that decision process and the others within it and the, and the environment that they're in who also wanted to experience whatever their different decision process was. Next part of it is what happens to the other parallels in that scenario? Are they dissolved then? if they are simultaneous or downstream from what we've been back, started backtracking. Isn't that counterproductive for our higher selves? Evolution through diversification via parallel cells. No, everything continues. So when we get a carbon copy, um, when we get the event space, the, the new event space created, the old event space is still there and can still duplicate. <laughs> so, so everything continues. It's only when the evolutionary dead end is achieved, the, natu the, the, the natural end of event, so to speak, that that event space then, like a reality, moves back into the mainstream, or the next mainstream um, part of the event space, so to speak. So everything continues. So if you think about it, you know, you've got one that goes into two, which goes into four, which goes into eight, which goes into 16, which goes into 32, as an example, you know, 64, 128 blah 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 then you start to see that the that which has been experienced by the first one which went into two is duplicated which went into four is quadrupled okay and so everything is happening but the, the, each of those times there's a duplication you start to see a variation upon what was being what is going to be experienced downstream or currently so to speak because of the decisions that have been made by the individuals in that duplicated or that new event space. Okay. The uh, next part of it is, is, or is this more like trimming out our event tree of life like a rose bush to make things more efficient, to get rid of the dying or dead branches to allow new growth to take place? That happens when we get to the end of an end of a, the end of event, which is the which is in effect the end of the evolutionary the, the, the end of the evolutionary opportunity. The, the evolutionary dead end, so to speak, or the experiential dead end, so to speak. So then things start to tri start to trim back, and they start to nip back into the in, into the the sort of next mainstream that was part of that that allowed them to be created. And so we go from the, if you like, if you're going to get an oak tree and you see the the tree the trunk going up, that's the mainstream, and all the branches are starting at the fractalization and the different event spaces being created. Then if you turned it on its head and you had all those uh, all those branches so let's 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 look at it in terms of the roots for instance all the roots then go back to the main the main trunk and that gives you that gives you the understanding how all these different fractalizations and event spaces can all coalesce back together again into the main event stream or the main event space okay very good question thank you very much and uh we're doing very well here let's have a look at um there's two questions from em and I really, uh, and I really do um, thank Ian for these. Question one, which is actually question three, I think, from the from the first set of questions. Does a false guru use mixed energies of light and dark energies to confuse their followers? Oh, I'm asking the question on that. That's a good. That is a very good question as well. And straight away, I've been told not intentionally. And by that, I mean. They don't intend to confuse their followers because they think that what they're doing is the right thing. So what they would do, they would, in terms of dark energies, what they would be would be low frequency thoughts, behaviors and actions. And those low frequency thoughts, behaviors and actions would be for self gain, for example, or self aggrandizement or material wealth or status or position. And 
the objective would be to gain that but not necessarily in a, a direct way they may what like the feeling of being put on a pedestal they may like the feeling of having wealth associated with their position they may like the opportunity to be able to guide others or, or, or coerce others into doing things that they wouldn't normally have done they might like the opportunity of, of, of controlling, commanding controlling people. So they won't particularly use energies uh, per se, directionally, but they may use them uh, subliminally or, or subconsciously. Okay. So the difference is, they, I don't suppose they use them, well, I don't, I don't, well, I'm being told that they don't. They don't use these energies or these, these or low frequency thoughts, behaviors, and actions in a, a conscious way, but they do it in a subconscious way. It becomes part of their personality. Okay. But um, in terms of mixing energies, no, it's more, it's more like a, for instance, a, <coughs> a false guru might say to you, um, it's it's okay to throw the sweet wrappers out of your, out of your car window because somebody else has a job to pick them up <laughs> actually they may have a job to do so but that doesn't mean that you should perpetuate their role well you should be responsible for your own th thoughts behaviors and actions okay and that's th and, and, and the false guru giving you the opportunity to, to negate your your um your natural need to work in a in a in, a, in, in the right way like not throwing the sweet wrapper out of the, uh, the 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 car window um is is what they do sometimes so they they give they make you think that you what you're doing is right because they they are doing it and that's not and that's not the right thing to do okay a guru may suggest that certain things are okay but don't get addicted to them. We have to experience, learn and evolve while we're in this particular low frequency environment, this planet. But we have to move in, be in the physical, but not of the physical. And that means you can do anything associated with being in the physical, as long as you don't get addicted to it. As long as you don't get addicted to having belongings or having material wealth or having status. You can have all of those things as long as it's not the primary motivating force behind your existence here. It may be, these may be the tools that you're using to be able to allow you to do the work you're doing. And if that's the way you think of them as being tools, then that's the right way forwards. And therefore, a, a guru who has a lot of so-called physical wealth or um, material belongings may just be using those particular belongings to help um, themselves, to help others progress as well okay so we have to think of them in terms of tools and the, the second question from em is i have some questions about relationships and what is the energetical function of relationships and are they necessary f uh, for an aspect to evolve are those that have harmonious harmonious fulfilling relationships hold up the frequencies are all sentimental relationships karmic um when a, when a karma has been negated, does that mean that an aspect could therefore move, move up to a higher frequency relationship? Can you also explain why so many people are now single? Right, I'll go backwards. So the reason why people are single now is because they're becoming more autocratic. They're more selfish. They want things for themselves, which is a low frequency function. Okay. When you're able to share what you've got, it's a higher function. When you're able to share what you've got and give it away, that's an even higher function. So <clears throat> these things are to do with lower, obviously lower frequencies. Um, in terms of energies, when we're working with somebody we want to work with or we want to be a part, have a partnership or, or, a, or, a, or a romantic relationship with somebody that we, that we see and like and love and they reciprocate that, the energies are intertwined together and we operate in a synergetic effect. So the benefit of that is that we, what we work with singularly is, is more than the, the, the sum of one plus one equals two. It becomes, for instance, two and a half or three. So it's so basically a harmonious um, relationship may be a higher frequency relationship, but not necessarily, because it, the, harm, the harmony might be uh, based upon 
a simple need to obey rather than a desire to work together. Okay, so, th so think of it in terms of the, the need to work. I thought, I'd so, sorry, I thought I'd switch that Windows notification off earlier, so I apologize for that. Um, so think of it in terms of working together as equals rather than one being done and so over the other one okay and then you start to have a higher frequency and again we're removing not all sentimental relationships not all sentimental relationships are karmic they can be simply that two people are working together to achieve something and there's no karma involved at all and they don't create karma so and that is a very high function of course generally speaking the moment we get together and we have children there's, there's that we start to get karmic links coming through because we have a relationship with those children and responsibility for them to, to grow up as good citizens and good service providers for their children for instance and those individuals that they work with um, in their future roles as, 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 as citizens that are being of correct service and responsibility okay right that's a good question Ace. thank you very much right next question last question is from jm um and this is from the the beyond the source books by the way and it said it's source entity four as i was saying this as i said before each of us has areas of that have energies that have function these functions are for the use and the maintenance of self with a view towards perpetu uh, perpetuation it would be best if i list these functions down from first and then ex explain their jobs in a little more detail later. They are as follows, structure, form, volume, detail, compartmentalization, singularity, diversification, multiplicity, self-remembrance and being. And I think the question is, I'm, I'm used to thinking of significant things in sets of 12, source entity 4's list of functions coming at 11. Is there one more function or does that even matter? Um, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, with, with the except that sometimes the, f the, the, the function of 12 is, is, is based upon structure and, and duplication. Whereas when we looked at the, the, um, the functions of source entity 4, we have structure, form, volume, detail, compartmentalization, singularity, diversification, multiplicity, self remembers and being. The 12th, if you want to, cook, want to look for a 12th, would be the overall of that which is source entity 4. So the functions of source entity 4 are all those 11 plus the correlation of the of the results of the operation of all those 11 together to create the 12th. So the 12th would be correlation Source sensitive force just told me that. He said that's the best way to describe it correlation. You can call it averaging if you want to as well, but it's saying correlation. The correlation of all of the, all of the above is potentially the 12th function. So, um, the answer to the question is it doesn't really matter, but <laughs> as you've noticed that there is 11 there and there usually is 12. And then Source Sensitive 4 tells me, you know, well, think of it in terms of the, the, the cumulative effect of all those 11 things to create a correlated understanding is the end result. And therefore, that's the 12th um, function, so to speak. Very good question. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. OK. Right, so that gives us, brings us to the end of the questions for this satsang in December. And uh, actually, we've, we've been really faster than the previous uh, satsang, which was in, in November. I think November's was around uh, between an hour and a quarter and an hour and a half. Whereas this one's, uh, right now, we've got to about the close on 40, 49 minutes. So we can have a good look at, at this meditation to allow us to start the new year in a clean and clear and fresh way. Okay. So I thank everybody who's sent the questions in. So it's E, M, J, M and uh, U, S. Just making sure I'm not leaving anything else out. No. And um, let's look at this particular 
incarnation. I've just been looking at my speakers, by the way, <laughs> and I turn them off and then they come back on again. <laughs> so, so every time there's a, an announcement from Microsoft, they must want to turn the speakers back on again. They'll just turn them off again. So I apologize for the previous two times and this, this chime came in. <laughs> I think that uh, my computer's being controlled by somebody else, not me. Okay. <laughs> So let's um, sit in our straight back chairs. If you haven't got a straight back chair, try and find one. Okay. Or you can sit down cross-legged. That's also fine. Or, or, even, or even kneeling down. Okay. So put your, your palms or your hands palm uppermost on your upper thighs. That's the area where the legs meet the lower body. And close your eyes with your closed eye vision on the point in between the two eyebrows and above the bridge of the nose, the center of the forehead. And I want you to just relax. I think we started the November's satsanga off with a breathing condition, breathing exercise. Let's just breathe into the nose in the same way. Fill the lungs up from the bottom of the lungs up to the throat and then breathe out through the mouth, expelling the air from the throat down to the bottom of the lungs. Breathe into the nose, fill the lungs up from the bottom of the lungs up to the top. Breathe out through the mouth, expel the air from the lungs, from the top of the lungs with the esophagus is. I think I use the word throat, it's esophagus. Expelling the air back down again to the bottom of the lungs. Just remain calm. Now I want you to see <coughs> that the new year, which is simply in four days time, we've got the 29th, the 30th, the 31st, and then the 1st of January, is a start point. I know that everything we've experienced to date is an, acu is an ac cumulative effect of everything we've experienced from our whole incarnation, this particular incarnation. And moreover, the things we've experienced recently in this last year, or even the last month, or even the last week or days. Sometimes we have a bad year when we have what we think is a bad year because lots of family members have departed or friends have departed and gone back to the energetic. Sometimes we may have an, have an illness or a partner's got an illness. Sometimes we may have a condition where we've been problems at work, we may have lost our jobs or gone to a new job, or maybe we've had an accident. Okay. I want you to just realize that those have just happened. Now I know that everything exists concurrently. And so I want you to think of what we're going to do now in two particular ways. You can think of it as spherically or linearly. Okay. If you think of it linearly, then everything's happened. That's going to happen. Everything that will happen, will happen. But where we are right now is a neutral point. With a point between what's happened to what is going to happen. If you're thinking spherically, we're at the point where everything has happened, is happening, will happen, should happen, could have happened, has happened. But we're in the point where nothing is happening. So both in the linear fashion and the, and the spherical fashion, we're at a point, a, a potential experiential point. A lot of potential energy. You know, if you throw a ball up in the air, it gets to a point where it stops for a moment. 
and then drops back down to earth. This point where it stops for a moment is potential energy. It's potentially having the energy removed that project propelled it up there and potentially having energy as it drops down towards the ground. It's also called a zero point in um, in magnetic motor technology. Okay, the point at which a, the magnet forces itself across the coil, which is also creating a magnetic field. And you get this point where the the push and the pull are almost equal for a moment before it becomes pull and push. In this point of neither forwards nor backwards, future nor future nor history, or potential for this or potential for that, or possibility of this or possibility of that. We are no longer encumbered by anything that we think we've done badly, could have done better with, have experienced as being a bad thing, or experienced as being a good thing. We are simply in a position where we are experienceless. That is current experienceness. We still have the, ex the experiences and learnings and learning and evolving from what we've done in the past, but right now we have nothing that's going to affect us. There is no thing that we have experienced that affects us anymore. There is no thing that we could experience that is going to experience, going to affect us anymore. There is no thing that possibly could have, should have, would have, might have, or will do that will affect us anymore. So we're in a clean sheet totally. Fresh in the knowledge that as we move forwards, we can use that which we've stored in our, in our energetic memory or our experiential memory set to help us face whatever happens later in the next year, 2020, in the most efficient way possible, making our incarnation efficient. Not wasting time or experiential energy. So just feel that nothing concerns you, nothing bothers you, you've done nothing wrong, you will do nothing wrong, nothing will bother you. You have no desires, no wants, no self-contained responsibilities. No debts. No expectations of debts being repaid. If people owe you money. There's just you now. In this version of you now, you simply have to recognise that from this point onwards, everything is new. And you can deal with it in the efficient way, dealing with, dealing with whatever you experience by giving yourself the time to experience it properly and the time to respond to it properly and react properly, only experiencing it once rather than multiple times. This is the way to start a new year, fresh. No worries, no depression, no anxieties, no previous demands or expectations.
There is only you with no thing that is going to inhibit your ability to move forwards. There's only you now in this nothingness. Think of yourself as being born again. No responsibilities, no demands, no expectations, no desires, no anxieties, no wants, no addictions. realize how cleansing this is no more feeling of I must do that I need to do this I'm embarrassed by how I did this so I responded to that or have done wonderful in this and wonderful in that. Just be clear, pure, energy without expectation, desire, demand, or history. Or anticipation. Let this state of beingness reset you totally. So that from this point onwards, everything is just a challenge that you engage with to allow you to move forwards and experience, learn, and evolve not only for yourself but for your true energetic self and for the source and for the origin fresh in the knowledge that everything you do serves a purpose even if it's just something like mowing the lawn enjoy what you're doing whether it's easy work or hard work joyful work or terrible work know that whatever you're doing you're doing it for the better good. Enjoy having no lead weights attached to you. There's nothing you've done in the past that's a problem. Everything's been, slate is completely wiped clean. Now I want you to consider this point where you are as a point you can get to every day. Every day when you start, before you get out of bed or when you find a, a quiet place to go to before you go to work or when you've got to work or if it's over the weekend before you start your activities just spend five or ten minutes putting yourself in this zero juncture in between the future and the past in between the possibility of this the possibility of that the could be of this the could be of that maybe a should of this maybe a should of that Wipe the slate clean every time and move forwards so that you don't just move forwards at the first day of a new year, you move forwards every day in a clean, 
and recalibrated and sterilized way. We'll just absorb this feeling for a moment before we finish this satsang and allow you to recognize how grateful one should be by, putting, by being able to put oneself in a position of complete forgiveness because this is what this does. At this point you've done nothing. And it's all to experience. There's no right, there's no wrong, there's no error, there's no correction, there's no boasting, there's no pride. There's just now. You can create this now every day. So let's just feel it for a moment, a moment longer. And now slowly come back into the room. Slowly open your eyes. Take a drink of water to help ground you. And bask in the feeling of being born again, renewed and refreshed. So that's the end of this particular satsanga. Thank you very much for listening to this satsang on the 28th of December 2019, the last satsang of 2019. Next one will be in January, towards the end of January. And uh, I think it's going to be... <laughs> Speaker's been turned on again. So let's have a quick look at the date. And the next one in is going to be on January the 25th. So enjoy this satsanga and enjoy yourselves in your renewed state and have a great and wonderful new year and don't forget to send everybody including yourself god's love the love of source namaste to you all and namaste from source Did you see the aliens in Crete?